whom I had the pleasure to see earlier today in a very insightful panel on food security. Um, my name is Grégoire Ross, and I coordinate political um, dialogue at the BMW Foundation, a 50-year-old foundation committed to promoting responsible leadership in business and politics and in um, advancing a fair, just, and sustainable uh, transformation of our socioeconomic system through the advancement of the sustainable development uh, goals. Um, I would like once again to thank very warmly the Deputy Prime Minister and Foreign Affairs Minister of Slovenia for hosting us in beautiful Bled. So for those of you who have had the pleasure of walking around or even enjoying a swim in the lake, you will have realized by now that this is a jewel of the uh, Judon Alps and one that has played a very important role in European, Yugoslav and Slovenian um, history. I don't think I need to tress, stress how massively disruptive this year um, has turned out to be politically, economically, socially, militarily, of course, and not to mention ecologically. And we're only in August, so I think we should also fasten our seatbelt and prepare for further turbulences ahead as some darker clouds are mounting um, ahead. 2022 has definitely been a blue and, and yellow year. But I would like, I can't refrain myself from thinking of it as a, an anniversary year. And I hope you'll excuse me to add s a somewhat morbid touch to an already quite gloomy context, the anniversary of a suicide. In February uh, 1942, Stefan Zweig and his wife Lotte took their own lives out of despair for what the world had turned into after they had fled their beloved Europe for Brazil. Stefan Zweig, is, as you all know, was a prolific Austrian um, a writer and one of the most translated authors in the German language. And he's not just well known for his uncountable biographies of Marie Antoinette or, or Nietzsche, but uh, all his novels and short stories. Um, he's also well remembered for what is now regarded as his magnum opus, Die Welt von Gestern, the, 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 light, the World of Yesterday. In this posthumously published autobiography, um, Stefan Zweig narrates the heyday of cosmopolitan Europe where cafes would be swarming with um, writers, artists, intellectuals, discoursing on the state of the world, uh, a Europe that would stand out at the world as a beacon of culture, humanism, and freedom. And then the First World War came, then the Second World War came, and by then, Zweig's Europe had fallen into the abyss of war, destruction, and totalitarianism, or in his own words, had sunk into darkness. But here we are, 80 years later, um, in a Europe that is much more united, much more peaceful in spite of all appearances in the eastern flank of Europe. But of course, the world has changed tremendously. Europe is now political united with a strong monetary identity. And it's no longer about just cooperating in issues of economy or even culture. It's about more integration on strategic issues such as security, energy, and industry at a time of particularly strong instability and geopolitical unpredictability in this world and when Europe's greatest ally, namely the United States, is pondering a strategic disengagement from Europe to focus on more pressing geostrategic and security um, issues in the Pacific. I would not want to drag on. We have a fantastic panel today. What I would like to say is that this, those next 75 minutes, will give us the opportunity to think about um, the impact of the war on, in, on Ukraine, on what it means for us Europeans to do more on our own, what others refer to as strategic autonomy. Um, this will be our quest within the next 75 minutes, and I'd like to welcome our first panelist on stage, Monsieur Alexandre Adam who is a French career diplomat, currently serving as European advisor to President Macron. Mr. Adon started his career at the French Ministry of Foreign Affairs before um, jo going to Brussels at the French uh, permanent representation and then the uh, embassy in Berlin. And Mr. Adon's leadership was, of course, instrumental in designing and ensuring the success of the French presidency of the EU earlier this year. Monsieur Adon, bienvenue. 
um, with us today too, um, um, Mr. Um, Michael Roth, whom we no longer introduce because he's the Bled Champion of the Year, was awarded the big prize yesterday. Um, Mr. Roth is a key figure in the, in the SPD Socialist Party uh, under the new coalition led by Chancellor Scholz. He has been a member of the Bundestag since 1998, then he was not even 30 years old, and he has been re-elected ever since, so perhaps you could give us some advice as to how to get re-elected uh, so many times. Uh, he was Minister of State for Europe under Chancellor Merkel, and in this capacity served as the German government's commissioner for Franco-German cooperation. And one thing I heard over dinner yesterday is that Michael Roth has never been invited to the Munich Security Conference, and as a senior partner of the conference, the BMW Foundation will make sure that your name tops the list of the guests next year. Mr. Roth, please. Uh, with us today, uh, we're very privileged to be joined by uh, Minister uh, Konrad Zimanski, who is Minister for European Union Affairs uh, in the Republic of Poland. Mr. Zimanski is a member of the ruling Peace, Law and Justice Party, started his career at Poznan City Council, and then went on to s work for the chairman of the Polish delegation to the Parliamentary Assembly of Europe, and then was elected um, member of European Parliament in 2004, where he sat for a decade before joining the government in 2015 and full member of the Council of Ministers since 2019. And with us, of course, last but not least, Ms. Anna Stanisch, please um, uh, join us. Ms. Stanisch is a uh, lawyer with, um, uh, who has been living in London for the past 18 years and has worked with a wide variety of, of stakeholders, states, international organizations, clients, uh, advising them and representing them on issues of energy and energy infrastructure uh, project. Um, I'd like to start, if you allow me, before we delve into more depth of discussion, um, to ask each and every one of you what strategic autonomy means um, from your own perspective. Um, and when I mean perspective, your current position, of course, but also your own cultural sensitivity. Something I'm very proud of on that panel is that and it's so uncommon that we have Western Europe, Central Europe, Eastern Europe represented, and we can really have a sense of, of how we can, um, um, I think, better align those, those three uh, blocks, if I may call them blocks. Monsieur Adon? Thanks a lot, Grégoire. Thank you for inviting me to Bled. And my, uh, I must say that when I received the program and that I saw that title for this panel, uh, I immediately uh, answered or confirmed my participation because I felt that this title without the question mark was a provocation that I had to respond to, of course. Um, there has been first, what does this mean? But there has been many words used actually to this, to um, to stress on the, 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 the same concept. Uh, French President President Macron started with European sovereignty. Uh, then he was told that basically that was not perhaps the main better word, so shifted to strategic autonomy. But it was criticized as well, so now he uses also, uh, he, he uses again European sovereignty. But the, the, the word that I find the best is the one of the uh, German coalition, uh, strategic sovereignty. Um, what is this for, for, for us? This is um, the willingness and the capacity to decide uh, and act by ourselves, for ourselves. Uh, following our interests and, va and values. And to put it very shortly, it's being open without uh, being dependent, I would say. My second remark, and wanting to be short uh, here, is that we have never had um, uh, comprehension and understanding of uh, European sovereignty as being limited to uh, the defense uh, area for for us, for France, it has always been a much wider concept encompassing uh, all other domains that uh, we will tack tackle, I'm sure, uh, but like trade, like uh, food security, like energy. Uh, so it should not be uh, limited only to, to defense. Thank you very much. Anna, perhaps you could bring the in the legal perspective. Um, well, rather than try to define things, since the lawyers try to not define things, I'll talk about it in terms of what, are, what I think are the minimum conditions for there to be strategic autonomy. And I think one of them has already been mentioned by Alexander, and that is energy. And I would say it's energy security slash energy um, affordability. 
Um, second, would, I would say, would be um, a strategic condition would be a rule of law. And that, I think, is not only for strategic autonomy. I think that is key to basically the position of the EU as a geopolitical player. I think that is quite key. And I'll turn to what I specifically mean about the rule of law and the importance of that in, term, in, in a moment when we talk about it in greater detail. Um, thirdly, I would say that one thing it's not, and I think that's also been said just now, that it doesn't mean the lack of interdependence. So it's not about cutting off our connections with the rest of the world. So I think that's quite important. Fourthly, I think it's all, it needs to be about the survival of our industries, survival of our economy. And I think I'm specifically referring to the, uh, the fallout from the war in the Ukraine and the sanctions in that respect, and I'm happy to elaborate on that. And finally, most importantly in some ways, is the ability to actually have uh, dialogue and legitimate divergences of opinion. And I think we need to have that possibility in order to sec in within the EU in order to secure a long-term strategic autonomy. And I'm happy to talk about each of those in a moment if we have time. Then talking of, of diversity of view, I'd like to turn to, uh, to you, Minister. Um. I think the concept of strategic autonomy or strategic sovereignty is much older than the, the well-known, uh, very important intervention of President Macron in the European Parliament. So we have a historical context. That's why we uh, could observe so many reactions to this, to this intervention. Because uh, we already are uh, autonomous in many, many aspects. We are fully autonomous as a trade union, as a custom union. We're fully autonomous in terms of regulation of the internal market. So if anybody in uh, 2020 would like to rise the, the new uh, horizon for autonomy, it's a high time to ask, what does it mean what in, in, for, for Europe? Poland uh, definitely supported, even before the war, for many, many years before the war against Ukraine, that Europe shouldn't be so much dependent on, on energy, especially Russian fossil fuels. We advised it to, especially German government, uh, to cut the logic of mutual interdependence because we believed that one day we couldn't imagine the, the horrible developments last month, but we, we definitely believe that one day this interdependence will play absolutely devastating role for Europe. It will limit uh, our strategic freedom to act against the, the, the aggression. So we didn't need the experience of the war to say that we should be less dependent on fossil fuels from Russia. Today, we are quite open to discuss uh, and other problems of dependencies, like the dependencies of semiconductors or rare earths from China. Let's talk about it. But we definitely oppose uh, building the uh, European autonomy uh, in security and defense, where Europe would be moved away from the transatlantic partnership. This war, I think it's a final uh, argument in this, in this tension, that's why the, uh, the connotations to death are fully legitimate. This war proves very clearly that we can uh, address the problem of our security only together. And of course, Europe should do more on security, no doubt, but only in line and synergy in partnership with the whole Western world, because otherwise we will be not able to, to address the problems in a, in a way which is, which is needed. If security of Ukraine would be dependent only on uh, European Union, only on uh, some European capitals, we would be lost. Only coordinated action, that first of all, Ukrainians would be lost. But we also, we would be lost as well. We need uh, much uh, in intensified uh, coordination of actions in, in security. That's why NATO is, is a backbone of our own security. Uh, European security uh, as well. We need much wider cooperation, and not competition, but cooperation and coordination in sanction polit politics, in uh, humanitarian military assistance, and, and so on. That's why we were so uh, vocal in opposition to, to autonomy understood as a, as a separate effort to, to build uh, defense and security uh, in, in Europe in parallel or, or maybe even competition to, 
transatlantic partners, and we are so much open to discuss any other issues, like the dependency on energy, dependency on the rare earth, uh, critical uh, dependencies on, on semiconductors, uh, and um, let's say recalibration, at least talk about recalibration, of our trade interdependence. We are, of course, promoters of free trade in the world, and, and, and we will be. But uh, after pandemia, I think there are good reasons to think twice about the, the, the shape, the map of interdependences. Here we are quite open, but in security we are very clear. We need more synergy in the Western world, and Europe is just one of the, of the, of, of, of one part of this. I think, thank you very much, Minister. I think Monsieur Adon will have the opportunity to, to, to uh, re bounce back and follow up on that, perhaps to clarify the, the, the French position. But I'd like to turn to Ms. Ms. Mr. Roth um, as regards his own definition of strategic autonomy. First of all, thank you so much for having me. I feel really honored. Um, well, um, it seems to be a broad consensus here in the panel um, because I'm not fond of the term of uh, strategic autonomy. I'm very much in favor of uh, strategic freedom or strategic serenity. Maybe it's much clearer. And um, the, the war against Ukraine um, emphasizes a bitter reality. The EU is not able to defend itself. itself. The EU is not able to defend Europe. And so I'm grateful to Conrad, uh, who uh, pointed out um, serenity, strategic serenity, doesn't mean independence from the United States. But we have to do much more. I think it's also bitter uh, that many EU member states are not willing or able or capable uh, to support Ukraine military, that the Ukraine has the chance to win the war and, and that there is a chance that we can defeat Russia. That is also a problem. That's why my government, for instance, uh, established a 1 billion euro fund in order to um, um, increase def defense spending. That was one of the biggest mis problems and biggest mistakes on the domestic arena in my country, and uh, maybe it, was, it would be better to, to listen more carefully to our neighbors in Central and Eastern Europe. And that brings me to the role of NATO. Um, NATO, the, 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 the war and the, the Russian aggression uh, was a reminder that um, NATO is key and vital for us, for our defense. And I can't agree more with my French uh, colleague. We shouldn't talk just about defense and security. The uh, energy dependency is much too high. So what we really need is more diversification. Um, the, we are too much reliant economically from authoritarian regimes like China. And this is a long and bumpy road. And it doesn't mean uh, that we cut our economic uh, ties with other regions all over the world. It's not, definitely not the case. But uh, we have to invest much more in innovation, in research, to make the European Union much stronger than it is now. So, um, and uh, I would like to add another point. Um, last but not least, the war illustrates how vital unity is. Unity of the West, unity of the European Union, unity of NATO. And yeah, we have to listen to each other. We have to accept that there are different perceptions, different point of views. But what we have to do is to act united. And the decision-making process within the European Union is not forward-looking. Um, in times of crisis, in times of war, we have to speed up our decision-making process. We have to be more vocal, more visible in Eastern Europe, but also in uh, Southeastern Europe. And we need a mutual understanding of the role of EU in a globalized world, because this is not just a regional war in our neighborhood. This is a tragic uh, conflict between imperialism, colonialism, and nationalism on one hand, and democracy, 
rule of law on the other hand. And we have to highlight that democracies, open societies, liberal democracies are able to cope with such a tragic crisis and that we have the chance to safeguard and to protect the people in our countries, to protect our culture, to protect our human rights, to protect our, our values because the union, the EU is first and foremost a union of common values and not just a monetary union or a single market. Minister, would you, would you um, um, elaborate on, on that importance of um, common shared values? I know it's very close to uh, Prime Minister Morawiecki. Um, and and what, 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 what role has it played in your own approach and that of your government in, in, that, in, that, uh, in that sense? I think it's obvious that Europe is united not only by the market but also by the same uh, civilization model based on human rights, democracy, rule of law. There is no controversy about the values among us. But at the same time, time to time, I think in almost every capital we have some controversies about the implementation of the values in our capitals because we are diversified. And uh, sometimes uh, this sort of controversies has to be solved by even international uh, courts. That, that's all. I think we, should, uh, we shouldn't um, um, understand the, the controversy we have as a, as a, as a, as a war. So, in, in terms of much more fundamental than, than it is, because uh, the, the values of the treaty uh, are exactly the same as the values of Polish constitution. The implementation and the, the, the problem of conferred competences of the Union, I think it's, uh, it's a valid point, not only in Warsaw, but uh, especially in Berlin, where the, the, the problem of conferred competences were many, many times uh, defined by the constitutional uh, court. But in the same time, we should remember that this confrontation in Ukraine or against Ukraine uh, is not only about the values, it's also about the right of nation to be free and right of nation to determine their own future. And uh, Ukrainians, uh, of course, they have the right to decide about themselves and to choose, let's say, more European model for their, for their own economy, their own society, legal system, and, and, and so on. But the core, the basic value, probably in almost every uh, war, it is uh, national sovereignty. And, and that's why, uh, apart from democracy, rule of law, values, human rights, we should remember that this war is also about national sovereignty, which is endangered by the imperialist uh, tendencies in, uh, in Moscow. I'd like to... to um follow up on that in a few minutes, but i also like to, to go back to Anna regarding energy and, and you, Michael, uh, uh, just stress that, that this is also um, not just a question of defense, but also of energy. Um, there's now an almost total embargo, almost total, on Russian oil and gas, um, but that has yeah. not meant, you, 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 you will correct me, but, but we, we have significantly reduced, an embargo might not be legal, from a legal point of view the, the right word, but we have we have made massive efforts to really phase out of, of Russian oil and gas. But that does not mean that we've stopped using them. We are now reverting to cut off oil in the US for liquefied natural gas. So we've shifted from one dependency to the other. So the question would be um, how to reduce energy dependency and, and uh, from a legal point of view, what will it take for Europe uh, to phase out uh, Russian oil and gas? Well, I'd, I'd actually take, I'd like to tackle that question slightly differently, and that is to say what has been the impact on our energy situation as a result of the actions taken in the consequence to the invasion of, of the Ukraine. And so I think, and the order of the actions are quite important, I think, in my view. And the first of that is that we, the European Commission announces on the 18th of March of this year that we are going to reduce our demand for Russian gas by two-thirds by the end of this year. Now, not only was that and is not achievable, and in fact the European Commission changes its mind already by the 18th of May and admits that that's no longer achievable and now we're talking about a 15 VCM reduction overall, but the impact of that has, is twofold. One is that it sends the market into tailspin. So we already had energy prices out of control in 2021. So prior to the invasion of Iraq. So we must take all of those in consideration 
when we analyze the impact and, and, and in order to say what it is, as you asked me, what are the things that we need to do later on. So I think we need to, you know, the order, the chronology of the things is really important. And the second uh, impact of the Commission's, I would say, pretty immature and irresponsible actions in that statement in terms of the reaction to the market, because the market reacts to make statements made by politicians, the second impact of that is that actually we had legal contracts, binding agreements with the Russian suppliers for that gas. So we, or the Commission, had indicated that we were not going to honour those contracts. So those are two impacts, and that will take me back to the argument on rule of law, but from a different perspective in, if, if we have a time to talk about strategic autonomy in that respect. Now, what, where does it leave us? As you say, we have taken steps to reduce our dependence on Russian gas since then. We are talking about potentially achieving a reduction of 70 BCM in that reduction. That's from 155 BCM means a bit less than half. But that's only because we have been busily buying Russian gas until now, and we're looking at not being able to buy Russian gas going forward. So that puts us in a slightly different position because in 2023, we still need to find 155 BCM of gas from somewhere else. Now, the Commission, and I think we will reach the target that the Commission originally set that we get 50 BCM, and that's 50 out of 155, so 50 BCM from LNG this year. I think we'll meet, meet that target. I think we will likely, on the whole, meet the target of um, gas storage of 80% by the 1st of November. But that leaves us with a gap. And that gap is very difficult for us in the, in the industry to see how it will be filled. And that is in, and especially if the winter is cold. Um, the, the why I'm saying that is that if a winter is cold, the difference that that means is between 20 and 30 BCM. Now, those figures might seem like little because they're sort of little numbers, 20 and 30, but actually they're huge. And just to give you an indication of the size, the, the, the amount of extra Norwegian gas that we have secured this year has been 7 BCM. And that's the maximum that we will get. There's no more. The Azerbaijani gas, we got 4 BCM. So if we have a gap of 20 to 30 BCM, and, I, and the other thing to emphasize is that the impact of the lack of gas is not going to be evenly felt. So Spain, Portugal, France are not in a position to help the rest because the gas flows in one direction, not in the other. So we have a, a, a significant issue in terms of energy security, hence, and that's only for this year. If we talk about 2023, we then have no if and all predictions so far assume that we will have a return of gas and gas by the beginning of next year because the scenario of no Russian gas, of no 155 BCM, is basically unimaginable. So, in just, so, so we are in a catastrophic position in terms of where we are. Now, the one thing that we need to understand, and this is what uh, President Ursula van der Leyen referred to yesterday, and that is that we are now not only facing a gas crisis, we are facing a power crisis. And now it's the power crisis that is actually um, uh, pushing the gas prices. So there's a, a basically, a, 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 what I now can't think of the word, but it's basically a, a reinforcing a cycle that is now happening. Um, and, and that power crisis is driven by different cri things. So it's driven by France and the difficulty with uh, nuclear power, um, low rivers, so the difficulty to get the coal up, up, the, up the rivers, um, um, and, and then all the whole issue of hydro and the drying up of rivers. So we have these, uh, and we basically have a, we are in, a, in the eye of the storm is where we are now. And so this is the reality. So when we talk about the casualty, there is a casualty and it's directly palpable. Well, what we have to now decide, and I think the other thing we need to think about 
is that I, I think it's, gr it's very important that we uh, reconsider, as you asked, say, our en energy dependency and consider whether we're replacing one energy dependency to the other in respect of fossil fuels in general. But I think what we need to realize is that this is a long-term process. So to the extent that anybody is of the view that LNG is somehow a solution, I'll just tell you one thing, that until tw the year of 2026, LNG is nowhere near in a position to actually play a balancing factor in the world. And the luck that we've had this year in being able to obtain 50 BCM of LNG is because the demand in China and in Asia has been low. Now, if that changes between now and the end of the year, because the, the, the winter is cold, not only here, but primarily in China, then the whole thing changes. And also, if demand picks up in China, then our ability to secure more LNG in order to replace the 155 BCM, so 50 plus Mm -hmm. Another 100 mm -hmm. becomes very okay. difficult. Now, you, you're talking about unimaginable. I turn to Monsieur Adam. Uh, I mean, it, it isn't exaggerating to say that President Macron has been the, 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 the spearhead of the movement to um, intensify the, the strategic thinking around what it means to be able to do more on our own. Um, it will soon be three years since President Macron gave his famous interview to The Economist in which he s said that NATO was, was, was close to being brain dead. Um, and this comes almost when, at a time when Finland and Sweden are about to abandon their sacrosanct sovereignty, um, sorry, uh, non-alignment, uh, neut neutrality, um, and, and will join NATO, which means that technically only four um, members of the EU will not be members of NATO. So uh, was this unimaginable, just uh, bouncing back on, on that term? And does that mean that France is swimming uh, alone against the current? Well, <coughs> thank you for our swimming skills. Uh, that we are fine. No, but actually, we are extremely happy that NATO is back from brain dead, because this is the case. And this is exactly what was done during the past months, uh, the work uh, on the strategic concept. Uh, which is refocusing on, on its roles and missions and refocusing on uh, the security and its defense and, dis and, and dissuasion posture uh, for the Euro-Atlantic uh, area. And so, and I think we had a very good NATO summit in Madrid uh, for the decision which we're taking. And you mentioned the one about accession on, of Finland and Sweden. Uh, and we are uh, an active contributor to NATO, uh, which is, I think, the best proof that uh, we believe I mean, in that organization in the current context uh, to ensure the security uh, of uh, our allies. Uh, we are now a uh, uh, framework nation in Romania. Uh, this is the latest uh, development in, in, in our presence. Um, but I would also uh, take the opportunity to just to reflect on what Karan Shimonski ju just uh, said before. Um, we, n we never conceived um, call it European sovereignty or strategic autonomy as a binary choice between this concept uh, and the transatlantic relationship. Uh, never. Uh, what was clear for us is that uh, the U.S. Uh, need, do not need followers but contributors. Uh, and what we witnessed at the beginning of this debate was basically that, and I'm not talking uh, about Poland or, or Germany, but, but that those who oppose the most to the concept of strategic autonomy, autonomy was usually those who were contributing the less in terms of defense, uh, defense spendings uh, within, uh, within NATO. And so the U.S don't think that they are just not waiting or, or asking for burden sharing, but also for Europeans to take more responsibility in their own security. And that's what we have been starting during the last years, and it has been speeding up uh, during the French presidency, starting with the summit in Versailles, uh, with the assessment by the Commission of our capability gaps and the investment gaps. And the, the trend on which uh, we are now 
with the instruments that uh, the Commission has proposed and will propose uh, for investing uh, in our defense capabilities, I think is a sign uh, of uh, a stronger European sovereignty contributing uh, the, between Europeans to uh, a strengthened uh, NATO. Thank you for that. Uh, Michael Roth, I remember a speech from um, your back then uh, foreign minister and member of your party, Zima Gabriel, at the security conference, um, stressing that, but you might also comment on, on that as well, uh, stressing that we could no longer really um, entirely rely on the US and it was about time that Europe does more on itself. So are we seeing a kind of Franco-German alignment in this regard or do you still feel that, that, that there could be a, a stronger integration of views between France and Germany? Thanks, Scott. Uh, the American President Biden is one of the strongest and most reliable allies of Ukraine and uh, NATO and EU member states to defend our values, uh, to defend uh, the sovereignty and the freedom uh, of Ukraine. But we have to take into cons consideration what's next. I'm not sure if the next US president will remain committed in the same way like US President Biden. And that means a special obligation for us to do our utmost best not to cut our transatlantic ties, not at all, but to invest more in defense, to invest more in innovation, to defense more in unity, to defense more in instruments and um, formats to be more capable to cope with such an unprecedented crisis and such an unprecedented war. That's my reply. And it doesn't mean that we have to start a competition with one of the leading democracies. Partnership is key. We have to strengthen our partnerships with democracies all over the world. And um, Conrad already mentioned it. There is a huge potential for the European Union to strengthen our economic ties with respect to trade. Fair and free trade, that is the message of the future. With Australia, with New Zealand, with parts of Latin America, with other countries. Uh, because if you, ha if you have, a f have a look on the situation in Africa, for instance, there is a very, very tough competition between China, between Russia and Europe and the United States or uh, in, the West, in the Western Balkans. If we, are, if we express ignorance, if we are not active, not vocal, not visible enough, other regimes which definitely not share our values be, become more influential. That is the problem. But it's not a competition between the European Union and the United States. It's a strong partnership. And um, the NATO is one of the key elements of this, of this cooperation and of this close, close friendship. Um, let me point out the idea of, uh, of national sovereignty. I'm, 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 I'm I agree with, 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 with many things um, uh, Conrad proposed, but I'm not really, uh, I'm not convinced that the idea of national sovereignty is a forward-looking one, because the EU is for many, many countries a very, very attractive model, but it doesn't stand for national sovereignty because the European Union is not just a union of sovereign nation states, it's much more, and you already mentioned it. Trade, for instance, is one of the core competences of the European Union. We have shared competences between the member states and the European Union, and this is a very, very attractive model for uh, countries here in the region, for Eastern Europe, uh, because Ukraine is not the only uh, uh, a country in Eastern Europe who wants to join the European Union. And what, that was one of the other mistakes. Uh, 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 Eastern Europe is not Mr. Putin's backyard. We have to accept and to respect these are independent, sovereign countries. And if they want to join us, we have to help them, we have to assist them, and we have to modernize and renew the, mod uh, the European Union that we are capable to invite others to join us. So, um, and that brings me to my third point, um, energy. Yes, it's true, 
the energy dependency of Germany and other EU member states is much too high from Russia. This is a tragic situation. And we are working very, every day very hard on um, reducing this dependency. But there's one big difference between authoritarian regimes and democracies like Poland or France, also Germany. Without public acceptance, I cannot uh, uh, ask my people in my country for supporting Ukraine, for investing, investing more money in defense, more money in military support. And that brings me uh, to the inflation, that brings me to the explosion of energy prices. Uh, German is the biggest economy in Europe. Our economy is robust, we have a strong welfare state and we have an extremely low unemployment rate. I'm sure it's not in the interest of Poland or France or other EU member states if our economy, economy com, um, comes under pressure. So we have to do our utmost best to establish a fair and just burden sharing to, 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 um, to raise uh, uh, public acceptance that, that, that the military and political and financial support of Ukraine and the strengthening of the EU and solidarity is in our own interest. It's in our own interest and it's not a problem for us in Germany. And we have to encourage others. Yeah, and uh, sometimes you get the bill very late to teach countries like Greece, Spain, Portugal, during or Italy, during the economic crisis, to say, okay, they are not able to save the money, they just spend the money and they are not uh, responsible or they, 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 they don't take responsibility for their own problems. That was not really fair. And so some countries are a bit reluctant or hesitant if Germany speaks about solidarity. Yes, we need the Polish solidarity, we need the French solidarity, we need the Spanish solidarity, um, because solidarity is always a two-way street and not just a one-way street. Time is flying always so quickly, so I'd like to open it to the floor. We have, of course, a thousand questions to ask. I think Mr. Grant in the first... I will get to you, but Mr. Grant has been raising his forehand for the past 15 minutes. Do we have a, a microphone somewhere, or shall we use that one? Thank you very much. So, uh, the gentleman in the second row, if you could be so kind as to very briefly introduce yourself, and even if you don't speak in the name of your organization, stay the organization you represent. Is this working? No, I'm not sure. Is this working yes, now? Yes, it okay, is. Okay, good. Charles Grant, Centre for European Reform in London. Uh, a very brief question for Alexander Adam and for Konrad Szymanski. Firstly, for Konrad Szymanski, um, surely... Um, Michael Root and Alexander have a point, Conrad, when they say that we can't be sure that America will stay committed to European security forever. Um, let's not forget that President Trump came very close to pulling America out of NATO when he was president last time. So isn't one, I, one justification for e efforts to build strategic autonomy and defense the, the sort of insurance policy idea in case America pulls out? So th that's my question for, for you, Conrad. For Alexander... I've never been clear, Alexander, when the French talk about strategic autonomy, do, do they sometimes think that the British could be included in that, although they're outside the EU or not? It seems to me that Europe would be more effective and able and have more weight in standing up to Russia or anybody else if you could find a way of associating the British, assuming that they wanted to be associated with your defence and security arrangements. So would, would you like the British in or not? Thank you very much for that question. So, Minister, you want to start with that? Yes, whatever we think about the internal developments in uh, America, I think we are the last who would have a reason to uh, preemptively uh, implement this scenario of disintegration of NATO. Uh, we hear the tone, we hear the comments last many, many years, and not all of them were very constructive, but in the end, nothing happened. And of course, I can agree that Europe should do more on security but not to compete, but to contribute to our uh, own common security architecture. Because we know very well because that without a coordination and cooperation across the globe, among the Western world, so-called, uh, we simply can't be effective. And we have to revive, I think it's already happened, uh, our bonds, um, with not only America, but also Canada, Japan, Australia, New Zealand, all countries which were 
very active and very ready to cooperate in this horrible crisis uh, of, uh, of war against uh, uh, Ukraine. I think this lesson is most important. This lesson will define European Union in, in a much profound uh, way than our uh, theoretical or political, metapolitical observations coming from the strategic compass, autonomy, metapolitical debate, or the conference on the future of Europe. This is the reality check. And this reality is telling us very, very simple thing. We have to cooperate. We don't need to compete. And th this is the way how to build the good arguments for internationalists in the US as well. Because of course, we all have limitations. We all have our public opinion, Americans as well. If we really want to, to do this, we have to, do, to create a good arguments uh, for internationalists and to limit the argument, to weaken the arguments or, or, of, of, uh, of um, those who would like to separate uh, America or any other country from the Western community, because this is the way how to be uh, effective. Whatever we think about German dependency on Russian gas or about some comments made in The Economist, today we can be very happy. He here as well, we, we agreed that NATO is key, I hear it two times from Michael Roth during 30 minutes, that uh, the autonomy is not binary black and white choice between Europe and NATO, I hear it from Alexander, and whatever we think about the past and whatever mm, experience we have because of historical memory, uh, we should build on this. And I would propose to build on this that we have a quite consensus, quite wide consensus that this is the way how to be active and effective in the world affairs, which will be if, uh, worse and worse, to be honest. I'm not optimistic about it. Europe and the Western world, the community of values, whatever we think about it, uh, will be under pressure, under growing pressure, sometimes military. This is the most horrible scenario, but trade, uh, rare earths, uh, any sort of competition, any sort of pressures will come to us. And that's why we have to reinvigorate the community of the West. Thank you very much, Minister. Um, Monsieur Adam. Thank you, Charles. Um, I mean, the concept uh, of European sovereignty in the UK, European sovereignty was conceived uh, as, I can't see Charles, Charles. Uh, I mean, as an EU concept, because it relies on EU tools mainly and EU policies in the trade, defense, uh, instruments, uh, the energy market, in the CAP, <laughs> Common Agricultural Policy, uh, that uh, Poland and France like very much. It's also today, I think, an instrument of European sovereignty for our food security. Um, on the other hand, uh, well, first, as you know, despite Brexit, despite some statements uh, by leaders, we are very big allies, and the defense co the bilateral de defense co uh, cooperation between France and the UK uh, has uh, always been uh, extremely strong. Uh, but if we try to, to think a, a bit uh, of the future, or no, I will remind one thing of the past. Uh, in 2019, the president, uh, in an op-ed in many European newspapers proposed the, the creation of a European Security Council. And the idea was precisely at the time that uh, after Brexit, uh, the UK could be associated to the strategic discussions on security issues that are of concern uh, for uh, EU members, but having the UK uh, around the table. Uh, can't say that this project, uh, I mean, really became a reality. Uh, nevertheless, uh, with the proposal that the president made uh, of a European political community, to which we really hope the UK would participate in, uh, we think that we have here uh, a, a new forum uh, to have strategic di the discussion uh, with the UK around the table uh, on all the uh, security and defense policy issues. Of course, not defense or collective defense, which uh, will uh, continue to be for NATO uh, to, to care of, uh, but a good forum to associate uh, the UK. I think Michael Roth, you wanted to comment on that very 
briefly before we take more questions. L ladies and gentlemen, you should know, we three know each other for a very long time, um, especially Konrad and me. Um, well, and that brings me to Charles Grant's uh, question, uh, the role of you, the UK. Um, um, we three were very much involved in the Brexit negotiations uh, in the Council of Ministers for uh, General Affairs. And we tried to convince our British friends to establish a very close cooperation with respect to common foreign and security policy. And the British government withdrawed all ideas and all initiatives to establish such a cooperation. And that was one of the biggest disappointments for me because three years ago, four years ago, two years ago, it was crystal clear that we have to take as Europeans more responsibility on the global stage. Thank you. Uh, Anna, yeah, I think you wanted to comment. Well, I just feel that, that I want to emphasize that in my view, the defense is only one part of the strategic autonomy. Mm. And I'm just fearing that the, cons the discussion sort of veers in that respect. And, we, and my main concern is where do we get with demand destruction by the end of this year and the mid of next year, which means the total destruction of our industry. Then for me, the debate on defense and everything else becomes much of an irrelevance because we have people who are unemployed, we have industry that is destroyed, I mean, we have already recognized as part of our strategic autonomy many years ago, and the Commission has prepared numerous reports on the need to ensure the survival of our industries, the difficulties that our industries already have in terms of being competitive. We facing a demand destruction isn't, doesn't mean that within a year all of those industries come back. Actually, it actually means that they never come back. And I think it is that reality which we don't hear enough about um, in this discussion, particularly the, the topic that we're talking about today. And I think that is the reality that if you are concerned about the buy-in of the public for the, the sacrifices you're asking them for, um, I think the reality is going to be a much harsher one. And it's basically not going to be an option that they will be facing because they simply won't have any food on the table. Thank you, Anna. I think we had many other questions, but we have time. So we have two in the second row, Mr. Powell uh, and the lady and Mr. Powell. And behind, yes, and someone in the back, can that person raise, okay, and that person as well. Thank you. Milena Lazarevic, European Policy Center, Belgrade. Uh, my question primarily goes to Mr. Adam and Mr. Roth. Um, to what extent do you consider EU's enlargement to the Western Balkans as part of the formula for ensuring EU's uh, strategic autonomy? And how would you propose uh, in that process to deal with the autocrats of the region? Uh, I think that one of the lessons learned from dealing with Russia and Mr. Putin is that you should not appease autocrats. Um, would appeasing the autocrats of the region and uh, stimulating further integration be better or would um, sanctioning um, reversibility in the EU integration process, uh, isolation, etc., would be uh, better policies at this point in time? Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Adan, you want to, to start? So how enlargement can basically strengthen uh, our strategic autonomy? We have made lately some steps uh, in that regard. Um, the question being, uh, I mean, the issue for us and for, for the European strategic autonomy being, of course, the stability of the region and then the speediness of the enlargement process. Um, uh, and in that regard, and this is, I think, a uh, uh, widely shared uh, feeling that uh, this process uh, is still too, let's say, too slow and cumbersome. Uh, and in that regard, having a more gradual approach to the, uh, to the, ac to the enlargement policy uh, and to the accession and basically uh, having members of the Western Balkans more, much more closely associate, associated to the initiative that we're, we're taking to reduce our dependencies, I think would play an important role. That's what uh, has been ta started to be done uh, with the uh, uh, common gas purchase uh, initiative. But for sure, I think that in the near future, in the, in the months to come, especially when it comes to uh, 
the energy crisis, uh, there will be, we will need to in involve uh, much more uh, the region in, in the EU debates. Mr. Roth. Strategic sovereignty means that we have to take more responsibility for peace and uh, stability all over Europe, uh, in particular in the Western Balkans. And um, we have to regain trust and confidence uh, because um, the image of uh, the European Union became extremely negative because we couldn't keep our promises. Visa liberalization with Kosovo, um, opening accession talks with Macedonia or with uh, Albania, the unacceptable veto uh, of Bulgaria, that's disgusting. And the biggest problem we have to face in Serbia. We have to, st we have to stop this weird strateg strategy of equidistance between EU and Russia. On one hand, um, Mr. Vucic is one of the strongest political leaders in the region. On the other hand, his main argument for the strategy of equidistance is because my, the people in my country don't want to cut their ties to Russia. Now it's, it's high time to make a decision and alignment with respect to foreign and security policy facing such a tragic war is key and is the precondition for any progress in the negotiations. But um, if we are not active, if we are not visible and vocal in the region, others will, 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 will strengthen their influence. And again, these authoritarian regimes don't share our values. And so it's in our strategic interest to stabilize this region and the enlargement, I know it's a delicate issue for many countries, enlargement is the most attractive tool for us. But without any political rebates, democracy, rule of law, fight against corruption is key, but it's not just up to the countries and the regions, also up to us to um, renew our commitment. Thank you. I think we have, may, may of course, Minister, yes. If I may add one remark about this specific issue, because we are not so close to, to, to the Balkans as many of you, but we are very, very committed to, to support the enlargement process because we believe that it is in, in our own European strategic interest. But we have a problem, of course, uh, Michael Roth said it very um, openly, with almost 100% non-alignment with common foreign and security policy of Belgrade. And this is an autonomous, let's say, problem. But we have also some capitals with a 100% alignment in Western Balkans with CFSP. And all of them are stuck. All of them are stopped in the process of enlargement. What sort of message we are sending as Europe that it doesn't matter, that whatever you do, you are nowhere. So this is why the passive, let's say, at least passive approach to enlargement by at least some capitals in the EU is so devastating for our influence around our borders. I think the, 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 the conclusion of this observation for many years is very negative for most pro-European powers in, uh, across the, the Western Balkans. And this is why it, it is so dramatically bad. This is why we advocate to do something real as quick as possible, because at the moment we are doing uh, definitely too less and too late. Mm -hmm. Mr. Powell and the gentleman in the back, I really, I'm ashamed of keeping, skipping you all the time. There's a very tall person in front of, in, in, the, in the line, so. Thank you, Chairman, and thank, let me thank all the panelists for these very interesting contributions. I'm a strong defender of European strategic autonomy, but I dislike the name because this, the way in which it's often interpreted is that we are seeking autonomy from our friends when, in fact, we should be seeking autonomy from our foes. Um, I don't particularly like sovereignty because I think it's a very, frankly, a 19th century concept, and we in Europe um, should aspire to move beyond that, and therefore I would advocate strategic responsibility. 
the pandemic showed how incredibly irresponsible we have been. Um, when it struck, we didn't even have the ability to, to um, provide our populations and our doctors and our nurses with um, protective equipment. We can't even produce enough paracetamol, for Christ's sake, you know, in the EU. Um, and, of course, the, the war has shown that we have, were also criminally dependent on, on Russia. Let me just add, um, Anna, I think, men mentioned this in her last intervention. I think we should be more proactive about the concept as well, and I strongly recommend... Uh, that people read the uh, Spanish-Dutch um, non-paper on strategic autonomy, which stress the notion of open strategic autonomy. This is not about being protectionistic, and I think it has some very, very good ideas on industrial and technological autonomy. And can I um, uh, raise a specific question with our, our French uh, speaker? Um, Mihail talked about solidarity. Absolutely, solidarity is a two-way street, and Spain would like to show its solidarity with Germany in, in times of need. And of course it can't, because the Iberian Peninsula is an energy island. Um, we have the best LNG facilities in Europe, but they are useless, because we cannot share that LNG with you. Now, Anna has pointed out LNG is not a solution, but eventually um, a pipeline connecting the Iberian Peninsula and France, and if France refuses to help, perhaps through Italy, could also be useful for a green... Um, um, for, for, other, for other purposes, for green hydrogen in particular. So my, my question, specific question is, uh, Chancellor Schultz has recently met Prime Minister Sanchez. They have agreed on the mid-cat um, gas pipeline. Is France going to jump on board or will it continue to obstruct this? Thank you. No, thank you for the very direct question. Uh, because saying that we obstruct is, I'm afraid, untrue. There has been... No, but there's been a report by the two regulators from Spain uh, and France in 2019 saying that the socioeconomic balance of the project was negative. So, of course, uh, in the wake of the current crisis, we, will, we are doing some expect, uh, expert work uh, to see uh, how to reinvigorate this project. But the fact is that if we do so, it will take six or seven years before the mid-cut uh, interconnection is working. And six and seven years is not really the time frame in which we are in times of crisis. The second point is that in terms of solidarity, we are currently showing solidarity by reversing the flows uh, from Germany uh, to France, by making France to Germany, exporting gas uh, to, uh, uh, to Germany and, 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 and Central Europe. Uh, and finally, I mean, regarding uh, the Iberic Peninsula, there is also, I mean, the question of using the current interconnections to their full capacity. And if you take uh, uh, the period be between the start of the war in Ukraine and today, they have not been used at their full capacity. So first, let them use, let use them at their full capacity. And second, in terms of how do we respond to the current emergency, uh, if we need, I mean, for this winter, for the next winter, I'm afraid that even if we start now, I mean, the work on the Midcap project, it won't be ready for this winter or, or next winter. And for us, and this is also the policy of other governments, we are now building uh, uh, methane uh, terminals uh, in several ports. This is the, the case in France as well to import uh, GNL. And this is how we see that we will manage or tackle uh, this winter and, and the following winter. But we are not blocking. Second, there will be work, technical work, to see how uh, we can, uh, I mean, what can be the financial also conditions uh, of the, the Midcat project. But finally, it's not only about gas, it's about also hydrogen in the future. And there the, the question of a new dependency. That there's a real question if we want to import uh, hydrogen from renewables from the Maghreb going through Spain, France, to Germany, etc. And this is a new dependency. And I'm not sure that we are properly assessing right now what this would mean for these countries in terms of access themselves to electricity and hydrogen, 
but also because of the water resources that you need to produce hydrogen uh, and that, well, for obvious reasons, they usually lack. And that's why this is, I think, a more complex discussion that we have on these interconnections on how do we produce the hydrogen that we need. And here, of, we know we have different strategy with Germany on this. I mean, we want to produce hydrogen on the basis of nuclear energy. But that is, I think that the, the issue must be separ separated in the different ones. I mean, the, 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 the short-term one and long-term one, the gas and the hydrogen. Thank you, Charles. That was a very good question. We, we are running out of time, but I would really want to take the question of that gentleman in the back. Hi, my name is Romain Lequinio. I'm working at the International Republican Institute. I also manage a, a think tank back in France uh, centered on Central Eastern Europe and the Western Balkans. Um, I would like to, to basically first thank you for the, for, the, for the discussion, which was quite interesting to me. And uh, it convinced me also that European are quite close when it comes to strategic autonomy, tra strategic sovereignty. But unfortunately, we didn't find a way to framework, uh, to put a framework together to make uh, Europe stronger. And we are paying it today, and we continue to pay it. We are going to continue to pay it in the in the next few months and years, probably. Um, my question is centered on one specific aspect of this strategic sovereignty, uh, and it's very close to Milena's question. Uh, because it focuses, of course, on the EU enlargement. Um, it seems to me that there is an offensive, I would say, of France to have this new tool, which is the European political community. Uh, we saw it yesterday with the talk of uh, Secretary of State Laurence Boone. Uh, try to talk about this, um, but it seems to me that for, for the moment, the, the project seems a little bit vague. Uh, it seems to me that Unfortunately, European partners are not answering to this communication offensive from France. Uh, we saw that uh, Chancellor Scholz um, talked about this yesterday, but in the same time, the European partners stay silent on this. Uh, there is also some partners, and I think here in the, in the neighborhood, they are quite free about this potential uh, idea that will... So uh, what, what's your question, please? The question basically is the first from uh, Monsieur uh, Alexandre Adam. How do you, uh, what is the strategy of France to communicate about this and uh, knowing that it was very difficult for France to frame okay. European strategic autonomy, so how will you convince yes. and make this idea understood? And second, to the other panelists, uh, what do you think, what is your position on this uh, proposal from France? And Mr. Simonski, uh, why are you against this? Okay, I, I think we have exactly four minutes to answer all those questions and wrap up. So perhaps Monsieur Adam will just say a few words and then you can, all of you can integrate, if you wish, so uh, an answer to that question in your conclusion. Rome was not been built in a year, uh, in a day, sorry. Um, no, but uh, I mean, first, uh, regarding the support, uh, what, but I'm sure that you read the European Council conclusions in June and there was a consensus uh, to discuss the issue and there will be the convening of the first meeting of the European political community in Prague uh, on the 6th uh, of October. Uh, I think that uh, I'm sure that Laurence Boone made it clear yesterday that we don't see this as a substitute to enlargement. This is very clear. Um, but we feel that in the enlargement process, and this is one of the reasons of this proposal, there is really something missing. I would say it differently. I've been attending a lot of EU Western Balkans uh, summits, and it's usually a very asymmetrical um, relationship, a very asymmetrical format, where on the one side you have the EU pledging uh, the hand on, on the heart, on the European perspective, and on the other end, for very good reason, the leaders of the Western Balkans uh, blaming the EU for not going fast enough. And in the end, you never talk about the common challenges that we all have, I mean, as a European continent, and we tackled a lot of them about security, there is migration, there is energy supply, etc. Uh, because we are stuck in this kind of format, and the value that we see in the European political community is on the contrary to put everyone on the same footing, whether they are member states of the EU or not. And we feel that this first will be important. Of course, this is a bit vague, but because this is for us a very important project, which is at, uh, at, at its very beginning. So we will uh, build it by walking, 
uh, and the next step will be, and this will be discussed during uh, the, the, the summit in Prague, uh, what kind of cooperation project we can have uh, in this new format. Thank you very much. Minister, you want perhaps to very quickly comment? Very, very quickly. I just wanted to reassure that the picture isn't uh, black and white. We already have a common denominator already mentioned by, by Alexandre. And of course, Poland insists that any new structure shouldn't lead us uh, to any sort of uh, substitution to enlargement and neighborhood process. And we hear the reassurances from France two times a day, and we are happy to hear it. Of course, I'm not very sure that, uh, that I'm fully convinced because sometimes the intention can be different than the reality and the practice could lead us to something else. So we will be very vigilant here and we will insist to invite especially countries which are not uh, um, uh, on the road to, to accession because then we will have a proof that it is really pan-European uh, forum for uh, cooperation and coordination. And of course, on the other hand, we insist on this because I repeat since the beginning of this panel that, that we need a forum in, in Europe with the rest of non-EU countries, especially after Brexit, we need a structures to, to consult, to coordinate, to cooperate with UK, with Norway, with Switzerland. We see how the reality looks like. We need such a forum. So if the forum will be uh, about it, there is no, no problem. If the forum would lead, maybe even against the intention of the promoters, would lead to the situation when we will meet uh, two times a year with the accession countries and the accession process will be dead, then we will oppose. But at the moment, I think we are moving step by step to the, to the scenario which would be added value for this uh, community concept. Thank you very much, Minister, for that comment. I'm afraid that we are really out of time now. So I'd like to end up with a positive note and asking all our panelists in, a, in a less than a minute um, to forget about security, energy, if it's possible, and think about what Europe might look like in 10 years from now, and what would be their dream. Um, whether what Europe should look like, could look like, it's up to you to choose. And I'll start with, with you, Anna. Right, well, I'm pretty pessimistic, so I don't actually think there will be one. So that's my pessimistic position. Um, I wouldn't want that, so my ideal um, would be, well, to be very practical um, in terms of the enlargement point, if enlargement means that we move from unanimous votes to qualified majority, then I think that would be not a European Union I would want. Thank you. Stockwood. A bigger EU, more capable, more efficient, more democratic, more attractive. Uh, that brings me to your question. Um, well, a pan-European um, format already exists, the Council of Europe, focused on human rights. Um, but I can't agree more with the French president. Uh, the enlargement process is too long and too bumpy, the way. That's why we have to make the way um, uh, more attractive, and that means if uh, the candidate countries fulfill some criteria with respect to rule of law, we can invite them to join uh, Council of Ministers meetings as observers. They can benefit from uh, uh, EU funds that could be more attractive uh, than uh, new formations. But the idea to solve these problems is one of the most important ones. Thank you very much. Minister Zemanski. I think we should uh, realize that uh, Europe's future isn't granted anymore. And this is a huge change because I remember very well, we all remember very well, the time of European optimism just after the enlargement of 2004, and this situation uh, is, uh, is different. So we should keep much, much more attention about the future of Europe. I don't know what will be the future of Europe if I would be able to predict 10 years in such a continent, complex continent, I would be probably very, very rich. But uh, I can see, I can say, I can say what, what I would like to see. I would like to see the European Union as a strong alliance of equal partners, equal member states, uh, where the strength of this organization comes from the strength of the member states. The grassroots perspective should uh, prevail. Uh, of course, uh, with uh, the context we already have, with the context of a very strong, unprecedented regulatory regime 
um, of uh, of common market, which is much more, much much more than the, just a trade union. It's, it is obvious, and it will be developed. But uh, this, the political strength uh, comes uh, from the capitals, and the political will can't be substituted with the institutional experiments, with the institutional changes. Without political will to be together and to address the problems together, we simply can't survive the, the global, um, global challenges ahead of us. So more bottom-up movement. Th th thank you. Yes. Thank you, Minister. Monsieur Adam. Yes, I will make it very quick. Uh, a bigger Europe with uh, reformed institutions so as to get uh, more capability to act uh, in an efficient manner and, and quickly quicker, um, but as well a uh, geopolitical Europe who, which asserts itself on the world stage and which is also better uh, associating its uh, citizen in the decision making. Thank you so much. I think our fun fantastic panel deserves a big hand and I, I must say we have walked a long way um, uh, since the beginning and, and Stefan Zweig last act and we end up on a quite positive note. So I uh, thank you all very much and wish you a very uh, pleasant end of forum. Thank you very much. <laughs>